So today um, we're going to be talking about some of our common myths and um, questions that we are asked um, working with the coconut rhinoceros beetle. Um, so we're going to start off um, with some of our most common myths and Sana is going to go ahead and um, start with those. Hi, thank you, Arissa. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with our first myth, um, which is probably one of our most common myths. There's not really a myth or misconception, but it's more a misidentification. Uh, we get a lot of reports saying things like, I found a CRB or I found a CRB larva or my tree shows CRB damage. And while this might be true, there are a lot of lookalikes out there. Actually, none of the photos in this slide um, is CRB or CRB damage. And I will get started with um, some identification. So to the left is an adult CRB. It has an all black body without any pattern. It's about two inches long and has a horn, which is where rhinoceros and its name come from. So if you find a big black beetle with a horn, yes, you probably found a CRB. But if it's only about half an inch and has long antenna or is uh, metallic green or has speckles, it's probably one of its lookalikes. And then to the right, um, we have the CRB larva, which is white, has a large head capsule and can reach up to four inches. So if you find a white larva that is around four inches that um, and it's crawling on its side, then yes, uh, it's probably a CRB larva. But if it's smaller, it can be a little trickier to identify because the oriental flower beetle larva is uh, very similar to a smaller CRB larva. Um, so if you're ever unsure what kind of uh, biogo larva you're seeing, just take some photos and uh, send it to us. Uh, we will be happy to help you with identification. And the number and email that you can send it to uh, will be in the chat and also at the end of this presentation. And the adults will breed in any decomposing plant material such as green waste, compost, and mulch. And they can lay over 90 eggs in their lifetime. And the beetles will go through three larval stages or instars before it pupates and enter its adult stage. And I think a few things that are important to note in this slide is how much time it spends in its larval stage, as well as these estimated times in this graph is when observed at 30 degrees Celsius. And um, this can um, vary based on temperature or other environmental conditions. So why is this beetle so bad? Well, as adults, the CRB can fly and feed on palms. And when they feed on palms, they bore into the center of the palm and feed on the juices from the heart of the palm. And some evidence of CRB damage can be shown here in these photos with uh, boreholes and as well as the very recognizable uh, V shape. And um, sustained damage to this feeding can ultimately lead to three, uh, tree death. Um, but it's also important to note that some, there, uh, sometimes uh, rat damage or trimmer damage can look very similar and be confused with CRB damage. So once again, we are happy to help you with the identification. So feel free to always send us uh, pictures. So this will get us to our next myth. If my tree is damaged, I should cut it down. No. So a damaged tree can actually recover and it typically takes multiple feeding events for a palm to die and CRB feeds on different trees in their lifetime. If you cut down a damaged tree, it can lead to concentration of damage to existing palms or drive beetles to other areas. However, dead palms should be removed, and I'll get to why in just a moment. So 
the next few photos will uh, we're taking in areas of high infestation and show just how severe CRB damage can be. Here is a photo of damage we have seen in YPO Peninsula in a six to seven month interval, and the damage can be fatal. And these photos were taken at a park by Westlock in September of 2022. And as you can see, in more heavily infested areas, we have been seeing increased tree damage and standing dead tree trunks have become more common. In these cases, we recommend removing the dead standing stumps as they can become breeding material. So we have another myth, which is that CRB only breed in material from coconut palms. And this is also not true. CRB can breed in any decomposing plant material, such as any type of mulch, decomposing stump or logs of dead trees. As I mentioned earlier, that's why we want to dead decomposing trees. And in areas of high infestation, we have seen evidence of CRB laying eggs in bag compost that has been staged. And we have been working with garden stores to train staff to keep an eye out and not sell any of this material that shows that evidence. But this is a potential way a beetle can be brought directly into your backyard. So the best material for CRB to breed in is small particle size, actively decomposing and moist material. And the ideal habitat for CRB are areas where this material for breeding um, is abundant and host palms are nearby for the CRB to feed on. However, the breeding material and the food sources do not need to be directly adjacent since they are able to fly and find food. Windward Oahu has the ideal habitat since uh, this area tends to be moist and have a lot of that ideal breeding material. So we do recommend uh, treating and removing any potential breeding material and don't accumulate this uh, material. Movement of breeding material is one of the main ways beetle populations spread. And we recommend sourcing material as locally as possible. And as well as ensuring uh, no infest infested material moves to new locations. Treatment of any infested material helps to bring populations down. And I will now go ahead and pass it off to Keith and he will talk more about treatments and other myths about CRB. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sana. <clears throat> so the next myth we'd like to uh, cover is <clears throat> that uh, tree treatments will stop all damage to the palms. Uh, so this is really common if there's a, a landowner and maybe they have three palms they want to protect and um, they're in a neighborhood with lots of palms and they say, hey, can I get treatments on my trees? And um, <clears throat> this one's a little bit mixed depending on the method that's used, um, how big of a myth it is. So let's talk about the chemical treatments. The chemical treatments that we're currently using are either an injection or a soil drench with uh, imidacloprid or acephate. And these are systemic insecticides that um, require the beetles to feed on the trees to die. So <clears throat> even when the treatments are working, there's still damage occurring to the trees leading to the death of the beetles. Also, if you don't treat enough trees in an area, um, there's not going to be a reduction in the populations. So in the example where somebody has three trees, if they were to treat those trees and their neighbors have, um, you know, uh, uh, 97 trees, they're killing 3% of the beetles in their neighborhood, and that's not enough to suppress the populations, and they're still going to get plenty of damage on their trees. So when we do uh, treatments, we try to treat on the neighborhood scale, um, regional scale, and <clears throat> Um, there are some other treatments that are coming up um, that we've tested, like uh, foliar sprays with cypermethrin um, that we'll be um, adding in that we're working on a special uh, local needs for right now. <clears throat> that we don't have a lot of information on, on um, the efficacy other than beetles falling out of trees dead after the treatments. So wait for information on that. Um, physical treatments are a different story. 
So physical treatments do sort of fit in with this myth a little bit better, but they don't necessarily stop all the damage. So you can treat an individual tree and help to protect that tree with physical treatments like netting and sand. Uh, we haven't tested the efficacy of sand, but um, we hear a lot from, from people who have controlled CRB in other places that they like to use sand. Um, we've, uh, we've tested netting and, and netting works to um, entangle and um, prevent intrusion by a percentage of beetles, but not 100% of beetles. Uh, and it requires <clears throat> maintenance, so you have to reposition the netting as the tree grows. Uh, and you have to have access to the crown for all these treatments. So uh, physical treatments can protect individual trees. Um, the broader chemical treatments um, suppress populations locally. Uh, we also get a lot of requests to put traps on people's properties for control. And traps do catch some beetles, but uh, unlike some beetle traps, they're, they're not terribly efficient. So um, just like the situation where if you only treated three out of 100 trees, you're only getting a really small percentage, it's not enough to control populations. That's the same situation with trapping. Even if we put up 100 traps, we're only going to uh, catch a, a minority of the beetles in an area, and it's not going to be an effective treatment. What traps do for us is they allow us to um, track populations or, over time and compare populations um, in different parts of the island. So we have over 3,000 traps across Oahu, and we're increasing the numbers on outer islands. We have uh, trapping on airports and uh, now some seaports on the other islands and some other uh, critical areas. <clears throat> but um, we've only detected them on Oahu so far. So when we look at a heat map of where CRB are found on Oahu, this is slightly skewed because having a higher trap density means that you will catch more beetles and we don't have a uniform density. But um, this generally tells us where the beetles are on Oahu. So they're primarily um, on the western half of the island, although we have more recently have seen finds on the eastern side, including the windward side. The North Shore now has um, many breeding populations suspected, and we found a few of them. Um, and then the west coast is broadly infested now. Um, and the original sites of infestation, which are near Pearl Harbor, um, some of them we have gotten rid of, like uh, near the airport is, is fairly clean now when it used to be um, quite infested, but um, the areas west on the west side, <coughs> side of um, Pearl Harbor, including Pearl City, are still quite infested. So the next myth, um, that we've given up the fight against CRB. Uh, so this myth could come from some news articles that have come out recently. You can see on this slide, um, task force state has lost battle to eradicate coconut rhinoceros beetles. Some people might be left with the impression that that means the state has given up on fighting CRB um, or that the CRB response, um, we're not um, we're not part of the state of Hawaii, uh, like, like Department of Agriculture is. Um, but uh, so we're still working to uh, control and contain um, CRB. So if we look at this invasion curve on the right, um, when CRB were first introduced, we entered an eradication phase and while populations are still in a limited number of areas and limited numbers, the eradication is still possible. So we've made the determination that CRB has gotten to enough places that er eradication with our current methods uh, is not possible. Um, so we've moved to containment, which is the, the next phase, and keeping it from getting to new areas. So um, our main focus now is trying to keep it from getting off of Oahu. And then um, long-term control and management in areas where CRB uh, currently infests on Oahu. So if we look at our population data and how it compares to that sort of um, idealized curve, <clears throat> we had a number of years where populations were quite low and they were not uh, in very many areas, and we were working on eradication. Um, uh, populations, they, they continued to spread around Oahu and entered new areas, and those new areas had explosions of populations in many cases. So at that point, you work on containment, and we worked on trying to contain um, them to the infested areas. Now we're in a situation where there's enough places on Oahu that we can't, we can't, we don't have enough resources even to contain um, to spreading to new areas of Oahu. So we're working on containing them only on Oahu and keeping them off of other islands, and then working on control and management in the most infested areas. 
So Oahu is generally infested with CRB. It is not in all areas yet, especially the southwest coast is mostly free of CRB fines. Um, and the uh, on the windward side in, in the south, we're, we've seen some new populations in Waimanalo, but it's pretty recent, and Kaneohe. Um, Haula, we have a population, but um, Punalu'u, for example, appears to be clear. So um, we expect that most areas will become infested in the next few years on Oahu. Uh, so we're focusing on areas that pose a risk of transport to other islands. <clears throat> So the areas that we're prioritizing are ports um, that, that transport goods that could be infested off of Oahu, so air and sea ports. And then there are businesses that send CRB host material, including compost, soil type products that contain compost and host palms off of Oahu. So on those properties that we know of, we're trying to keep populations low so that the chance of spreading it is low. Um, uh, Arissa will also talk about some other strategies um, that will help to uh, contain the populations to Oahu. And then areas of high propagule pressure, by that we mean areas that just have a lot of beetles in them. If we can keep those populations lower, then the risk of um, uh, beetles spreading anywhere is lower. So we're still going to be working on Oahu to suppress populations in uh, a limited number of strategic areas. Uh, so for the rest of Oahu, that means that the community will be responsible for, um, and other stakeholders will be responsible for um, a lot of the control in the areas that we don't have the resources to cover. So just a map of some of our um, areas that we know we need to work in. Um, the orange uh, the orange stars are seaports or airports that have transit off of Oahu that, that might have risky material in there. Uh, and then we have some exporters who export potentially risky material um, uh, labeled with the yellow stars. So um, these, these are the areas that, that we're really uh, focusing on and um, the Daniel Inouye International Airport is, is, and uh, Honolulu Seaport are where the majority of the traffic is. So even though populations aren't high there, that's one of the places we're gonna start just because of the volume of traffic going through those places. But we're working on all these, all these areas. Okay, I'm gonna pass it off to Arissa now. Okay, thank you, Keith. Um, I'm going to um, cover the remaining myths that we'll be addressing today. Um, so to start, um, one myth and question that we get are that the same barriers are present as nine years ago. Um, and from the talk of this webinar, um, we have had CRV infestation since 2013. And one question um, that is asked is, um, if we were unable to eradicate CRB in the past nine years, what has changed and what's different now? Um, so with that, I think it's important to first acknowledge some of the barriers that were present um, that have been addressed in the recent years. So first, um, early on, there were limited tools to identify and treat breeding sites. Um, so now, um, in the previous years, we've developed um, many more tools, including um, community reporting, which has helped us to find breeding sites, as well as our canines, who are able to cover a lot more ground and identify breeding sites. And then of course, treatment of infested breeding sites, um, including fumigation and heat treatment, um, which we've been able to deploy. And then another barrier that was present in the beginning of um, CRB on Oahu was that um, no quarantines or restrictions on movement um, were present. So, or restrictions on movement of infested material were present. Um, so that meant that any green waste was able to move around, any infested trees were able to move around Oahu. And um, as Sana mentioned earlier, that movement of infested material contributes um, to the spread of CRB. So I'll go into a little bit more on that, but that's no longer the case um, with the HGOA interim rule that was issued last year. Um, there's now a restriction on the movement of CRB host material and host palms. Um, and then lastly, um, development of treatment methods. So as Keith went over, um, we do have now a few treatment methods that uh, we've deployed. So that includes chemical treatments like um, injections and soil drenches, and then as well as looking forward to um, 
more treatments like the um, dronal or the aerial application of cypermethrin, which we're hoping to um, be able to use um, in the coming year. Okay, and um, just also touching on a little bit of what Keith talked about with um, the shift in our program um, and how that will mean community and collective control. Um, so with our focus being in certain priority areas to have the most effect on CRB populations and um, to be able to control CRB populations, community um, control will be necessary. So what this means is, what this means is the seed banking of endangered um, native lolu. Um, so that's um, calling on different community members to um, protect obviously our native resources and then um, community members and organizations and businesses and different stakeholders being willing and um, willing to pay for treatment of infested material and for uh, managing CRB populations on their own um, properties. So um, this calls for um, the coordination of treatments by landowners, by community members, as well as um, what something that's really important would be the um, community um, advocating for um, proper green waste management in their communities and um, encouraging each other not to um, stockpile green waste and to adopt best management practices. Okay, and then our last myth for today is that it is okay to move green waste across the island. And while this was true um, a couple years ago, as of July 2022, HGOA issued an interim rule that regulates the movement of um, any CRB host material. So um, this rule is active for one year um, and it's expected to be a permanent rule. Um, it designates Oahu as the quarantine area and it requires any businesses who work with this material to be signed on to compliance agreements. And these compliance agreements essentially lay out safeguards that businesses have to take before moving this material, um, both on both within Oahu and then off of Oahu to neighboring islands. Okay, so um, as you saw on the heat map earlier, um, we have CRB infestations on Oahu and um, in this interim rule, um, no infested material should be moving um, from infested areas on Oahu to uninfested areas on Oahu, um, but especially important that it's not moving off of Oahu to the neighboring islands who have not had any um, detections of CRP. Okay, so under this interim rule, um, it covers CRB host material and host palms, so that includes material like um, chipped green waste and mulch, um, any decomposing logs or dead trees, um, compost, as well as the live host palms, which include coconut palms, fan palms, date palms, and royal palms. So this is the material that is regulated, and um, in order to move any of this material, um, safeguards have to be taken. So under the compliance agreement, it requires transport on Oahu, um, any of that material must move directly from the origin to the destination and undergo a treatment option that's listed here. And then requirements for transport from Oahu to a neighbor island. Um, this requirement is more strict. So this requires either uh, heat or fumigation and then um, the material needs to be stored in a sealed container right after that treatment and then shipped. Um, and then for any movement of host palms, it requires the um, participant to inspect the palm top to bottom. So from the crown of the palm all the way along the trunk and then around the root ball to make sure that there's no evidence of CRB um, in, the, in the tree before it moves. So this rule, um, restricting the movement of this material ultimately helps to restrict the movement of any potential um, breeding sites as well. 
Okay, and so um, just quickly wanted to go over um, some of the components of the CRB response. So um, we do a lot of things that we may not have covered in today's presentation, um, addressing myths. So I'll just quickly go over some of our main activities, um, which include trapping, um, our canine surveys, breeding site surveys, treatments, um, tree surveys, tree treatments, um, and then we have, of course, outreach, and we're always happy to answer any questions or help with any guidance um, that anyone um, feel free to contact us and we'd be happy to answer any questions. So that is all for today's presentation. Um, here is some of our information, which is also in the chat box. And feel free to put some questions in the Q&A box. And then all three of us are here um, and we'll be happy to answer those questions. Sorry, there's one question um, from an anonymous um, person. So they asked, are you already working with Hawaii Department of Education to engage schools and students in CRB prevention and control? And so, um, yes, we are. Um, we have been working with individual teachers and um, individual schools to try and educate um, students. Um, with that, we haven't gotten in touch with anyone um, higher up that can kind of connect us with all of the schools. So if you can connect us with any teachers, we're happy to give um, presentations to students and um, they seem to be super engaged in seeing the CRB specimens and um, yeah, they're, they're great resources for um, reporting and keeping an eye out on what's out there. Um, we have a few more questions that are being answered. Sorry, Keith is using the um, Hawaii Invasive Species Committee um, account right now. So um, those questions are being answered by Keith um, typed out. There is one question, have you found any CRB in packaged soil products in Hawaii? We often find grubs in new bags of soil purchased from hardware stores on Guam. Um, so we have found um, bags being infested by CRB when they're staged in infested areas. Um, a lot of the times it's hard to tell whether they're being infested at the garden stores or at the resident's home, um, but we do get um, a few, we have, been getting reports of people finding um, the larvae in the garden store bags. I think also uh, more on that is we have done um, some surveys of when we get reports of um, bags being found infested. Um, if they're in uninfested areas, we definitely go and follow up on um, 
surveying that material outside and checking for any other indications of infestations um, happening at the store. And we have worked with um, some of the garden stores to um, educate and just train employees on how to identify that type of um, damage to the bag that indicates that CRB um, bored in um, to the bag. Yes, also, sorry, Keith just pointed out, um, we also do have um, signs up at some of the garden stores that um, say to keep a look, keep an eye out for CRB and um, report if they see anything suspicious um, at the garden stores hanging up um, above those um, stage bags of compost and mulch. Okay, what is the number one thing people can do on Oahu to help reduce the spread of CRB? And um, this is um, some of our main recommendations that Sona went over. Um, again, is green waste management really is a critical part of managing CRB populations um, and making sure that no infested material is moving around Oahu. Um, so sourcing material as locally as possible as we mentioned, um, sometimes those bags of mulch and compost or garden store compost gets infested. And so buying as locally as possible, um, sourcing that material as locally as possible, um, making sure that you're not getting mulch from infested areas and bringing them to uninfested areas, um, making sure businesses that you're working with or getting material from are signed on to compliance agreements is another big one. Um, to make sure that they're also taking safeguards to make sure that um, they're not responsible for vectoring any CRB. Um, those are all some things that um, can help with the spread of CRB. Okay, I think we'll give it a few more minutes for questions, see if anything else comes in. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to um, put them in the Q&A or chat box. Um, and of course, you can always email or call us afterwards as well if um, any questions come to mind. Okay, um, with no questions um, coming in, I think we can go ahead and wrap up now. So um, again, yeah, thank you all for coming and attending this talk. And I hope that some of the myths were busted. Um, there'll be a short, yeah, um, there'll be a short um, poll again at the end, just some questions. If you um, could answer those, those would help. Um, and then of course, any questions, any comments, um, please ref um, call us, email us. We're happy again to provide guidance and recommendations and just information on anything that um, you'd like to learn about CRP. Okay, thank you all.